Luke chapter 24. That's the final chapter. Let's start with um, verse 36. I'm just going to kind of skip through this a little bit. Luke uh, 24 and 36. I'll jump around a little bit. Verse 36 says, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And they said, and he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? This is some very powerful verses of scripture because this touches on the bedrock of our faith. Paul said, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then our faith is a total waste of time. We might as well eat, drink, and go crazy. Uh, Jesus rose from the dead. This is a historical fact. This is attested uh, by history, by scripture. From a cold case detective standpoint, uh, when you look into the facts and uh, the evidences surrounding the resurrection of Jesus, it is impeccable. It has withstood the test of time, scrutiny. Uh, modern day um, antagonists against the scripture, they are, they are stumped. They cannot produce... Um, a reasonable proposition in terms of what happened when you look at all the facts in terms of uh, this was a common place that everyone knew in Jerusalem. You know, they didn't say, oh, it's in a mysterious cave in the far hills on the backside of Egypt. No, they said right in Jerusalem, the main city in this uh, rich man's tomb. By the way, his name is Joseph of Arimathea. That's where he was, uh, his body was laid. Uh, that tomb is empty. Everybody knows a Roman uh, guard was set there to watch it, to make sure his body was not stolen. And that body is missing. And there are reports of him appearing to many. I'm not going to go into that. We might touch that on Easter. But this, this is powerful. Here's Jesus saying, touch me. I'm not a spirit. I, this, I am a physical body. I have a physical body. Touch me. Now he's like, you got anything to eat? He's really getting to it. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, verse 42. He took it. He ate it. And then in verse 44, he says, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then verse 45 is powerful. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Part of my philosophy is that the scriptures is a, the scripture is a sacred and it's a spiritual book. Uh, you cannot just employ strictly an academic approach to the scriptures. There is an academic component where it has facts and information and uh, data content, but um, at its core, it's a spiritual book and it takes the Lord um, doing what he did in verse 45 to his disciples. He needs to do that to us where he opens up our minds and gives us to understand these sacred scriptures. So I like to say it takes the Holy Spirit to play the piano of the scriptures. And um, verse 44, it reminds me of a scripture that says, uh, Jesus says, I have not come to destroy the law and the prophets. I've come to fulfill them. And I believe verse 44 is answering that question as to what does he mean by fulfill the law and the prophets? Here it is. The law, the prophets, the Psalms, it was all pointing to Jesus. It was all a sign pointing to the ultimate fulfillment. And he's like, I'm, I'm that one. I'm what the whole Old Testament was talking about. So powerful stuff. Um, verse 46, he says, thus it is written that the Christ, that's literally, he's talking about the, the Messiah in Hebrew, Mashiach to be technical. The Messiah should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You, you are witnesses of these things. Now, if you know about a, a case, someone's been murdered or a crime has happened and they look for eyewitnesses. That's what Jesus is talking about. These are eyewitnesses. They see him resurrected. They saw him dead, executed by the Roman authority, accused of insurrection against the government. 
They saw him dead like all those other criminals that were hung on the cross. He was dead. That was confirmed. They were master executioners. Now he is risen. They are in a state of shock. The language Luke uses is they still disbelieve because of joy. They It was like this messes with your mind. We saw you dead. We had believed you were the Messiah, but when we saw you dead and hanging hopelessly on that cross, we figured it was over. But now he's alive and he's talking with them. And he's like, touch me, handle me, use your physical senses and confirm I am risen again. This is powerful. And now he's saying, you are witnesses. You are eyewitnesses. You see it. And then he says, behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. He led them out as far as Bethany. He lifted up his hands. He blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them. He was carried up into heaven. They worshiped him. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. That's how Luke's account of the gospel ends. I wanted to start with that before we jump into Acts. Very powerful stuff. The Messiah was crucified. They saw that. They, we saw the controversy surrounding him. Then he's risen and he's meeting with them, talking with them. Now let's jump to Acts. Let's jump to Acts. Let me just say this about Acts, or let me say this about Luke. Um, not much is known about Luke. Luke was not one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus. Uh, we know that Luke was most likely a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. We know that based on how um, Acts is written, because in many instances it's written in first person, and Luke says, we, etc. We were this, we were tossed to and fro on the ship. So you have the impression that Luke was actually with Paul as he was uh, capturing this account. So Luke also, uh, Luke is known not to be of Jewish ancestral lineage. Uh, Luke is a Gentile. Uh, Luke is, that's something that's very unique to Luke. He is a Gentile and he's yet responsible for writing most of the New Testament. If you include the Gospels, the book of Luke and the book of Acts, that comprises more of the New Testament than all of Paul's letters combined. Uh, so Luke also, we know that he was a physician and Luke was a historian and Luke was very meticulous um, and the data and the content that he presented in his historical account. And then finally, uh, we know that Luke is writing to an individual name, as you can see in verse one, his name is Theophilus. Not much is known, if, if anything, about Theophilus. We just know that this was the person that Luke wrote his first account, which we call the Gospel According to St. Luke, and this book called Acts, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, some say the Acts of the Apostles. Um, I like the acts of the Holy Spirit because we see the Holy Spirit expressing himself. Uh, let me, here we go. Expressing himself through different people. So that's Luke, a little bit of background about him. So verse one, he says in the first book, O Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach um, until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. I like verse one because Luke uses, he talks about Jesus and he says, all that Jesus began to do and teach. And I just find a, a little, nice little application there. I, I believe that what we do outweighs what we teach. That can sound a little bit sacrilegious. Um, I just believe that's in our actions and what we do, it carries the most weight. It carries more weight than what we say. We need to teach the right doctrine for sure. But um, I love this order of precedence that Luke establishes here. And let me say this, if you guys have questions, stick it in the chat. Um, if you have questions while I'm going through this, put a chat and I'll, uh, I'll cover that. Um, okay, we read verse two, he gave commands by the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chose. Verse three, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days 
and speaking about the kingdom of God. This is a loaded verse. We just read about him presenting himself alive. Okay. They were fascinated and in shock that Jesus is alive who they just saw dead. He presented himself alive after his suffering. And then it says by many proofs, many proofs. Now I'm keen on this whole scientific debate going on between atheists and people of faith like us and atheists are saying, you know, where's the evidence prove that God exists and the list goes on and on. Um, you can approach that challenge many ways, but here's something interesting. We know the Bible is inspired and um, according to God, according to the Holy Spirit, this was the proof. This was sufficient proof. You know, there's some individuals that no matter how much proof and evidence that you present to them, they will not believe. It doesn't matter. And they'll just keep saying, oh, that's not enough proof. Well, I'll see what you're saying, but that's not enough to persuade me. Um, this is enough. And I believe in the grand scheme of things, you know, um, God presents himself with enough proof, according to his wisdom, for us to believe and to have faith in him. And I like to say that God makes himself known enough such that those who are looking for him to find him, he has made himself known enough for them to find him. But he's hidden himself just enough such that people who are not looking for him and they don't want him, they will not be able to find him. And I believe that is very intentional uh, from God. You know, the notion that many people have is that God wants to just make himself known to everybody. And when you read the Gospels, you don't find that. Jesus didn't go around with a trumpet just blasting and said, hey, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah. Instead, he chose to reveal himself as Messiah to, to individuals, one person at a time. And I believe it's the same way today. Uh, God doesn't necessarily want to show himself in a one size fits all cookie cutter way. He says, hey, if you want to know me as an individual, come on a journey. And that journey is desire me with all your heart and search for me. And when you do that, I will make myself known to you. So Jesus reveals himself to us personally in a way that's etched upon the canvas of your conscience. And you know is real. And you have the proof and you have the inner persuasion because he has made himself known to you in your heart language. So that's my, that's my little rabbit trail in terms of this whole proof. But anyways, here are the proofs. He appeared to them during 40 days. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He appeared to individuals. He appeared to small groups. And then at one point, he appeared to over 500 people simultaneously. Okay. Um, there's no other explanation other than Jesus' roles that can match all the, all the data that's being presented. Uh, but 40 days, and then finally it says, speaking about the kingdom of God. That is the central message given to us from our commander in chief, the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God. What does our world look like if God were ruling it? How would things be if what God desired to carry out was being carried out? What if it was God's cabinet? What if it was God appointed secretaries of state and uh, defense secretary and department of uh, homeland security, et cetera. What if God were in charge? That's the kingdom. It's the king's domain. If, if it's, it's what things would look like if God were in control. All right. Verse four, while they, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. All right, so now we're getting some specific content that Jesus was telling them during that period of 40 days. So let's put this together. Let's put this together. 40 days after he rose from the dead, um, he appeared. He was making appearances to his followers. 
Um, I don't get the impression that Jesus was getting grand displays for everybody to just see that he's risen. I don't get that impression. I believe according to scripture, he appeared to individuals that were chosen to be witnesses to his resurrection and the manner that God wanted this good news to be propagated throughout the earth is for the believers like you and I, starting with those apostles and others, for them to have this message as eyewitnesses and to go and share that message. And as they would share it, he was saying, I will accompany you. I will be with you in spirit and I will confirm your message. I will give people an inner persuasion of the veracity of that message, the authenticity of that message. I will convict those who hear that message and they will be persuaded. This is the way God appointed the gospel to be spread. He didn't say, well, I'm just gonna make appearances in the sky. I'm gonna write words across the night sky and these types of things. He wants us to carry this message and to be heralds of it. And as people hear it, um, they will respond to it. I believe the human spirit is designed by God the creator in such a way that when they hear truth, truth resonates with them. All right. Um, there's a certain recognition that the spirit of a man has with truth because God made man. And uh, it doesn't come across like you're preaching about he man and Shira. Who, re who remembers that? He man and Shira. <laughs> it it's not like that. You proclaim Jesus came into our world, laid down his life and shed his blood. And, and God did that in his love so we can be reconciled to him. Uh, the deep heart essence of that person resonates with that. I'm not saying they just see it clearly and know it's true, but it's there's there's a resonance, there's a connection there that God put in place. And this is the way the gospel is gonna go. And that's what, that's what Jesus is sharing uh, to his followers. All right, let's go back to it. Cause I wanna wrap this up by about 8.10 or 8.15 at the latest. Let's go back to the text. See if we get through it. So we are in verse five. Wait for the promise of the Father, which said, which he said, you heard from me. John baptized with water. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. So he's making an allusion to John. John was a prophet. John was a forerunner of Jesus. John was sent to prepare the way of the Lord. And he was baptizing people in the river called the River Jordan. And his message was, Repent, change your way of thinking, uh, turn back to God, backslidden Israel, turn back to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, backslidden Israel, who have left God, turn back to God. Uh, and they said, John, what must we do? He said, well, if you've overcharged people, return to them. If you are um, a tax collector, stop cheating people, um, and, and many other things. It wasn't nothing deep. He was just like, you know, change your ways and really align yourself up with the God of your fathers. And uh, he would baptize them with water. So Jesus is saying, yeah, John baptized with water. That was for repentance. But you believers, witnesses of my resurrection, you are gonna be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from here. Powerful. Now, uh, let's give us a time reference. Jesus was crucified on Passover. Passover is a Jewish feast. I think the Jewish word is Pesach, I believe. Pesach, Passover. It's talking about the time when they were in ancient Israel and they were in the land of Goshen and the final plague uh, from God leveraged against the Egyptians was the spirit of death was gonna pass through the camp and all the firstborn of Egypt would die. The instructions were given to the Israelites to put blood, take hyssop, dip it in blood, kill from a lamb, firstborn, put it over the doorpost of your place. And when the spirit um, comes when he sees the blood, he's going to pass over you. And that's called the Passover. So every year God commanded, I want you to celebrate this. So you never forget how uh, the Lord sanctified himself, distinguished himself in the land of Egypt. So this is when Jesus was crucified. And I say that because Jesus being crucified was the ultimate fulfillment of what happened in Egypt and that feast that they were keeping for centuries. He fulfilled it because he was the ultimate lamb who shed the ultimate blood that would ultimately cover man from 
his inevitable death. So it's powerful stuff. Um, after Passover feast, there's a period of uh, seven weeks. And after those seven weeks, the next day initiates another feast. And that feast is called Shavuot. Um, another name is called Feast of Weeks. It's called Feast of Weeks because it's seven weeks after Passover. Another name for that feast is called Pentecost. They're all talking about the same feast. It's a feast that actually celebrates Moses coming down from the mountain with the tablets, with the law. It's called the Feast of Pentecost. So uh, Jews from all around, from all these different nations that they were scattered into, they would come to Jerusalem to celebrate these feasts. So they were there on Passover when Jesus was crucified. This was known. And then there's a seven week period and they're waiting for uh, the Feast of Weeks. And so this is a time frame. So 40 days after Passover, um, or actually 40 days after Jesus had risen. So I was, you, you could say 43 days after Passover, uh, Jesus was with them. He was with them. Um, and you're, you're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So you're about seven days from uh, the Feast of uh, Pentecost is coming. All right. I don't think we're going to get through this because I go into the rabbit trails. But verse six, um, when they came together, they had a question. Here's their question. Lord, <laughs> Wow, you're risen. You are ascended. You're back. You're alive again. You you are you are the Almighty God, spoken of by the prophets. Here it goes. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? What were they asking? They were saying, "Okay, we know all the messianic prophecies about the coming Messiah. You're it." You rose from the dead. We saw the miracles. We saw you walk on water. We saw you raise Lazarus. We saw you speak to water, speak to the sea, speak to the wind. We saw you stop a funeral and raise a young lady from the dead. We know you are the Messiah. You're it. You're going to take the throne of David and you're going to rule the world from Jerusalem, just like it says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, chapter 11, chapter 53. You're it. When was their question? When are you going to rule the world from Jerusalem? And, uh, when will the rule and the reign be restored to the kingdom of Israel? Throw out the Romans, rule Israel, not only Israel, but rule the world as the prophets say in the scripture. Is it right now? That's what they were asking. And Jesus answers them very directly. He says, it is not for you. He says, none of your business. No, he doesn't. He said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons, the epochs in the Greek, the seasons that, interesting, the father has fixed by his own authority. That is not given to you. That is classified information. That is, that is, uh, that is off limits to you. That is confidential. All right. You, you're not privy to it. You don't have the security clearances necessary to be uh, given that information. Now, my mind is automatically going back because um, Jesus was asked this question before, during his earthly ministry, before he was crucified and dead and buried. They asked him um, when his return would be, when he would rule the world. I think it's Matthew chapter 24 and uh, Luke, I forget what chapter Luke, but they asked him the same question. It's interesting there because there he said, um, no one knows this day not you know no man knows it and then he said not even the angels and then he even went higher than the angels that not even the sun that's a lot of theological content because he's elevating himself above the angels anyways he says not even the sun knows but here he answers it differently it just says well the father that is in the father's prerogative that's not for you to know interesting there's a lot of content there I could go into because this whole thing ties into, it's, it's like a wedding taking place. And really it was the prerogative of the father uh, to determine when this wedding would actually take place. And I, I think Jesus is actually tying into that. But, but let me keep it moving. We'll probably finish up with verse eight. Verse eight, he says this, 
It's not for you to know that when I'm going to rule the world from Jerusalem and when all that's going to take place. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Powerful stuff. Okay, so um, let me just finish this out. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Let me tell you what he did. He, he, he was lifted up, he was going up, and then he vanished right in front of them. As a cloud came and he vanished in thin air. And I believe he stepped out of this material dimension and he stepped into the spiritual dimension. That's what he did. They saw this. They were looking right at him. Verse 10 says, while they were gazing into heaven. So he had, I don't like to use the word levitation. That has new age connotations, but he had ascended up. Cloud came and then he vanished. So they were looking up into heaven. Then it says, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why did you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, look at the language, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. <laughs> you talk about rapture theology. I think a lot is right there. The same way you just saw him ascend and a cloud came and he vanished. That's the same way that he is going to return to this world and fulfill verse six. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Okay, very direct answer from these men who are angels. These are angels who appeared to them and they gave them a little bit of lesson on eschatology. So let me just wrap it up. Verse eight says, you're gonna receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That word power in the Greek is the Greek word dunamis. In the King James, you see the word power. Sometimes it's the Greek word exousia. Exousia is talking about authority similar to a police officer or similar to someone in our U.S. government having authority, all right? But the other Greek word for power, dunamis, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a force. Um, I don't know if our English word comes from that dynamite, but it's related. It's related to that. Um, but it's talking about a, a force, a power. You're going to receive dunamis power. Um, after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. So Jesus is talking about uh, the Holy Spirit coming and he talks a whole lot about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16. We're not going to look at that, but throughout his ministry, he was talking about when I go, I'm leaving, but I am going to send another comforter. And this comforter is the spirit of truth. He is going to be in you. He is going to teach you all things. He is going to show you things to come. He is going to comfort you. He was talking about this other comforter. That's the Holy Spirit. And um, now in verse eight, he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that opens up the doctrine, the teaching of the baptism of the Holy Spirit which we don't have enough time to get into tonight. I'm gonna stop it right there, but we'll pick it up from there um, next Thursday. We'll talk about what Jesus is talking about in uh, verse eight with being receiving power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon us and being witnesses. All right.